Today, this video is going to go over NCLEX example questions specifically related to pulmonary questions. Please make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you end up liking this video. It lets us know that you want us to make more of this type of video. Let's begin with question number one. The nurse is auscultating the lung fields and hears soft, low-pitched lung sounds. The nurse does not hear any wheezing, crackling, or other such, such adventitious lung sounds. Soft, low-pitched lung sounds are most common normal lung sound that is usually heard. What is the name of this lung sound? A. Bronchial B. Vesicular C. Rails or D. Bronchi If you guess B, vesicular lung sounds, this is correct. This is a normal lung sound, most commonly heard all over most of the lung fields, especially in the peripheral area. Now let's talk about some of the other answers listed. Bronchial lung sounds, this is a considered this is considered a normal lung sound. It is heard, however, over the trachea usually. Normally it's a higher pitch and a louder sound than the vesicular sounds. So if you actually, for example, listen to yourself over the trachea and then in the peripheral areas of your lung, you can tell the difference. Next answer was rails. Rails crackles, basically the same thing. It's a rattling sound, and this is considered an abnormal lung sound, often heard with things like pneumonia. Ronchi. Ronchi is very distinct because it has a snoring sound. It's often heard with things like bronchitis, pneumonia, and also cystic fibrosis. It's usually due because there's lots of secretions in the lung field that need to be cleared. Let's move on to question number two. A patient just had surgery two days ago. You are taking their vital signs and their heart rate is 105. Their pulse oxygen is 90%. They tell you that they've been feeling some shortness of breath. You call the on-call provider. There's concerns for pulmonary embolism. What is the best diagnostic test to diagnose pulmonary embolism? A. Chest x-ray. B. CT of chest without contrast. C. D-dimer. Or D. CT angio of the chest with contrast. If you answered D, CT angio of the chest with contrast, you answered it correctly. Now let's go over the other answers. Chest x-ray, you're not normally going to see a clot show up on a chest x-ray. CT of chest without contrast, contrast is needed to properly diagnose a pulmonary embolism. And D-dimer, often this may be ordered first if someone has shortness of breath, if you're trying to rule out many different things um, before you do the CT angio. However, um, a D-dimer, you gotta remember it can be elevated with many different conditions. One being um, if someone has renal disease, often the D-dimer is elevated in this as well. Let's move on to question number three. You note a pleural friction rub upon auscultation. What would be the best way to describe a pleural friction rub? A. Treading on snow sound. B. Popcorn in a microwave sound. C. Crunching sound. Or D. Zipper being zipped up sound. If you answered treading on snow, you are correct. Now let's talk about the answers a bit here and a little bit more information. Plural friction rub can sound very harsh and grating sound. And important thing to know is that a plural friction rub and a pericardial rub can actually sound very similar. They both involve inflammation, one of the lung area and one of the heart. If you can think of plural being related to the lungs and pericardial being related to the heart, when you're assessing, this can kind of help. Um, one way to differentiate between the two is to have the person hold their breath and then auscultate. If you hear that, that grating sound or that treading on snow sound, then um, when the person's holding their breath, then most likely it's a pericardial rub. If the sound goes away when they hold their breath, however, though, it's likely a pleural friction rub. That's a um, good little tip there when trying to differentiate between the two. Next question. A patient has normal saline IV fluids going at 150 cc's an hour. The patient complains of shortness of breath. What should be done first? A. Turn off the IV fluids. B. Call the on-call provider. C. Auscultate the lungs. Or D. Collect a sputum culture. What's your answer? 
If you answered C, auscultate the lungs, you answered correctly. Let's talk about this for a moment. The first thing that should always be done with your patient is assess the patient before doing the intervention. The issue with a lot of, um, or the problem with that a lot of students come across is they, they're used to doing an assessment and it takes them a little bit of time. You gotta remember though, most assessments can be done very quickly once you become very efficient at doing them. And so they don't take long. So I think a lot of students think that that's what kind of holds them up on thinking they don't think of the assessment coming first, they always think of their intervention. But normally the assessment needs to come before the intervention. Just remember that as key. If you think of the scenario of the code blue situation, what are you gonna be doing first with a patient who is unresponsive? You're gonna be checking their pulse, you're gonna be trying to arouse them, you're gonna be trying to assess how they look. And this all, all happens very quickly. It's not like it's taking you know 20 minutes to do. You're quickly gonna begin most likely your compressions, but you assess the patient first to see if they're breathing, to see if they have pulse, ABCs basically. And you can use the same kind of rationale when you're doing test questions, whether on NCLEX or just normal nursing test questions. It doesn't take long to assess the patient, but you need to try to evaluate and efficiently figure out what is going on so you can best figure out what the next intervention is going to be. All of the answers that were provided in this question may be things that you'll definitely be doing, like calling the on-call provider, maybe stopping the fluids, getting chest x-ray, things like that, but they may not be the first thing. So the key word is, what would you do first? Let's move on to question five. A patient has just been prescribed an inhaled corticosteroid. The nurse instructs the patient to rinse their mouth out after using the inhaled corticosteroid. What is the main thing that the nurse is trying to prevent from happening? A, shingles, B, canker sore, thr C, thrush, or D, strep throat. What's your answer? If you answered C, thrush, you answered this correctly. Let's talk about this question a bit. The important thing is to know the main side effects of medications. Now, it's impossible to know every single kind of medication, and I still learn new medications. New medications are coming out all the time. So one way to help with this is to know the classes of medications and just general adverse reactions of each class. No basic teaching points as well. Like for instance, inhaled corticosteroids, you need to have the patient, they need to understand that they need to rinse their mouth out after using the inhaled corticosteroid to prevent things like a fungal infection called thrush. It also helps to prevent things like sore throat and hoarseness as well. Now let's move on to question number six. A nurse is examining a patient who has a chest tube. The nurse notices that Around the dressing, it feels like Rice Krispies. What does this indicate? A. This is normal. B. Pneumonia. C. Coropulmonale. D. Subcutaneous emphysema. What's your answer? If you guessed D. Subcutaneous emphysema, you are correct. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Here is a slide with a lot of information on it. We'll just briefly go over some of these things. Um, the biggest thing about subcutaneous emphysema is it's just important to recognize. It's usually not a major concern, but it is something that it could potentially um, be th life-threatening. Um, so you need to obviously be watching for the patient's respiratory um, status, you know, watching their oxygenation, and how they're feeling, what their complaints are. It, usually the subcutaneous emphysema is found over the chest wall or the neck. They may complain of some aching in that area and it does have a rice crispy sensation to palpation, um, usually benign and it reabsorbs. So as I said, it's something that it's just most important to monitor it. It usually is pretty self-limiting. The um, patient may, may complain of some aching in that area. Um, if it is a little bit deeper, then it can potentially be life-threatening. So you may want to refer back to this slide as needed, but I just wanted to put a bunch of different things on there, and just so you're aware of subcutaneous emphysema, and when you're assessing what that means if you find that Rice crispy palpation sensation. Let's move on to the next question. A patient has a chest tube. The water seal chamber is continuously bubbling. What does this indicate? A, a possible air leak, B, nothing, this is normal, 
or C, the patient has developed an infection? What's your answer? If you guessed, if you guessed A, possible air leak, you are correct. There is a lot about chest tubes that you need to know, but this is just some very brief information. If there's an air leak, it should be found and fixed promptly. It's super important that that air leak is fixed. You can do this by checking and tightening any loose connections. A patient has latent TB. You're educating the patient about latent TB. All the following are correct teaching points, except A. You're not considered contagious with latent TB. B. You will not need to be on any treatment if you have latent TB. C. You usually do not have any symptoms with latent TB. Or D. Your chest x-ray is usually normal. What's your answer? If you answered B, you will not need to be on any treatment if you have latent TB. You are correct. Let's go over this a bit. This education is incorrect information. Even though an individual is not considered contagious, they'll still need to be on treatment to help prevent recurrence of active TB. Well, that's it for these questions, guys. Make sure to hit subscribe and also put a thumbs up to this video. This lets us know that you like these videos and you want us to do more of them. Um, also, comment below if you do have any particular types of videos or topics that you want done. Comment below and you might just see your topic on our channel. Also, be sure to check out our Pinterest site and our other sites like Facebook and Instagram. Also, check out our site, which is www.medmadeeasy.com. We have lots of quizzes, products, and other resources for you, you to help study. Well, everyone, that's it for this video. Just wanted to tell you that you are strong. Remember this. You're going to get through this. Keep on studying. Keep your head up high or keep your head down in the books, if you know what I mean. Either way, take care of yourself. Make sure to not forget those breaks and how important they are. And I'll see you next video.